going to uh, start out with my presentation. Okay, fantastic. All right, so I'm going to be talking about the role of the reliability engineer. And, you know, in my career, I've had a really uh, fortunate um, and to be able to go into many different companies and, and many different styles of um, manufacturing service related. And so my role as a reliability engineer that I'm going to be talking about is very broad. And I know most of us are into, um, you know, RCM and things like that. I'm going to give you a little bit broader picture and then I'm hoping that you're going to be able to get a copy of this presentation as well. And in the very beginning, you have my email. So any questions you have, please feel free to email me. Um, and there's a lot of detail in this presentation, but I'm going to go, go through it in a um, sort of a like a good sermon short and manner. <laughs> OK, the role of reliability engineer is huge. I cannot overemphasize that the role of the reliability engineer in the company is gigantic. And as Bill was talking about, a lot of the time, you know, management is making decisions based on your expertise, you're an on-site consultant, your reliability data helps management and your influence make the right decisions, which might be arbitrary otherwise. And so the role of the reliability engineer gets into new product development, safety, liability, loss, risk management, life cycle asset management, cost reduction. So it's very broad. And the reliability engineer, as Bill was talking about, needs to have leadership uh, skills, leadership responsibilities. And there's really six areas if you look at this, where the reliability engineer can impact and influence reliability. Reliability-centered culture, it's all about the culture. Maintenance reliability, cross-functional teams, okay? Design reliability, operations reliability, leading by teaching. So the reliability engineer must be good at working with people integrated product development teams. Um, you know, the whole idea here is to change the culture to a, a more reliability centered culture in the company. Now, um, I'm going to talk about some of the traditional reliability engineer roles and I can, you know, when you get this presentation, you could look at the detail, but you're building a lot of strategic partnerships in the company. Okay, cross functionally. Okay, obviously you're into root cause analysis um, and understanding the process for root cause, using the tools, but understanding that this is like crime scene investigation. It's a, you know, you're going to investigate, you're going to gather data, you're going to get the team together. And it's, it's you as a facilitator using your influence, using the people in your company. Okay leading teams, the whole life cycle management, asset management, starting with even the concept phase. Now, many of you have, have been involved in RCM and these type of um, <clears throat> programs in the company, and not all of us have the um, ability, or I shouldn't say ability, not all of us have the opportunity to get involved in new product development, but it is a really important aspect because the reliability engineer needs to get involved very early on, even in, in the concept phase. Okay, obviously with data analysis, as Bill was talking about, you need data. Um, and if you don't have it, you need to generate it or find it. You know, we have all kinds of mechanisms, uh, accelerate testing, things like that. So data analysis is critical to decision making and it's driven by the reliability engineer. Okay, so I'm gonna just switch gears here. When we look at products. We want high reliability, we want high quality, we want brand reputation. How do we get there? When you look at some of the products, new products today, and some of you have experienced some of these, 
you know, how did they, how well did they do? You know, um, I've experienced some new products uh, lately that um, I was absolutely appalled at the reliability. You know, you look at the Apple Watch is a good example. When the Apple Watch first came out, there were several failure modes. Uh, if you had really dark skin or you had tattoos, you know, the Apple Watch did not perform. It wasn't accurate. And they were so worried about time to market that all of the other uh, competitors looked at that as, you know, they just did this. Ah, oh, this is great. You know, these failure modes are great. You guys, you know, you really broke the ice for us. So anyway, when we look at a lot of new products today, you really wonder what was going on there. Okay. Now, very fundamental to the reliability engineer. You know, we have two phases. We have R&D design and we have production. You know, I have a picture here of Japan. Now this is cost of changes, okay? When we're in the design and R&D phase, we're in proactive reliability. We're in to pre failure prevention. And the reliability engineer really needs to get involved here. Japan, you know, they, they spend a lot of time, they incur all their costs. By the time they get into production, they have you know minimal changes now when we get into production we're talking about reactive reliability failure management okay and you know a lot of companies <laughs> i didn't want to say u.s companies but some of them are but many companies are doing this you know we're getting far on into uh production shipping product having customer returns and our, our costs go up exponentially. So the moral of this story is really, hey, get involved early on in the design, R&D, and the whole product development cycle. So we have proactive failure prevention. Okay, now the design phase represents the best opportunity to reduce our overall costs. And I'm not just talking about in manufacturing and reliability, I'm talking about maintainability, RCM, all of these aspects. So, you know, the traditional approach says, hey, this is these are a percentage of influence, design, materials, labor, manufacturing. Well, in all reality, it's like 70% opportunity, the actual influence on your total cost in design, if you want to be successful, is, is huge. Okay, now I'm going to just show you this. I hope this video works here. We have a little bit of accelerated testing going on here. <laughs> man that must be a maytag <laughs> anyway <laughs> why do engineering products fail well the design is not capable it, we've got overstressed conditions we've got not fail safe we've got wear out you know we've got several things and again opportunity for the reliability engineer to get involved so we have a we have a marketable product if you're familiar with maytag washer and dryers they've got a 20 premium on all of their competitors and there's other people getting up up there too samsung and lg and they're benchmarking maytag okay now take example your automobile there's several failure modes um, with your transmission alone, you could have several failure modes, different kinds of failures. We call them repeating failure modes. So the reliability engineer needs to do his investigation to understand this. Okay. Management of change. This is a big one. Change control. When we make changes to things. We need to have good. The changes need to be um, reviewed by a team, not just the reliability engineer, you know. 
Risk management, we need to get into that. The various risk management, especially FMEA, okay? Uh, we all know about FMEA, you know, this is not only process FMEA, but also product FMEA. And we've got a lot of cumulative, cumulative risk. Now, some, some things about FMEA that I just wanna to touch on here. As Bill says, this is a um, evergreen document. We keep it updated. And the bottom line here is probably the most important. The FMEA does nothing by itself. It's got to be used to drive change. It's not a tool that we just, you know, fill it in, get our risk and all that, and then we're done. This is a, a baseline document for reliability. And the reliability engineer needs to drive the use of that. Okay. I teach a class in uh, design for manufacturability, design for assembly. We start out with a part like this with many components, 25 whatever components, and we redesign it to a part like this. Okay, what we know about reliability, the simpler the design, the less components, the more reliability. We're all familiar with the copying machine. You know, the Xerox copy machine. I don't want to say Xerox, but everybody knows the copy machine. You know, it's got so many components in it, so many opportunities for failure that we've got to use a lot of design techniques, redundancy, fail safe, you know, simplicity in our design. And, you know, the DFA approach, or, you know, design for assembly approach is, is vital to us. And, and it, it carries on in the reliability centered matri uh, maintenance and all these aspects. So again, starting in the design. Continuous improvement, reliability engineer needs to be intimately involved with that. Identifying opportunities for improvement, measuring the defects, going after root cause analysis, cost benefit, okay? Again, life cycle management, I talked about that. 95% of the total cost of, of ownership or life cycle cost is determined before the product is even put into use in the early on in design. So again, um, design and installation for products for new assets, modification of existing assets. We need to understand that. We need to go after life cycle asset management. Okay. I wanted to just kind of play the video here. And there's no um, audio, um, doctor. No audio. Okay. Okay, I'm going to move on. All right. Thank you for showing that slide is we get into what I call analysis paralysis sometimes. And a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about is very academic. Um, and if you're doing, you know, 50% of this collectively, you're doing well. In reality, the reliability engineers got a really big ticket. There's several things involved and it's a sort of an evolution when you get into a new company. But um, um, a lot of this is academic, but we need to have a balance of reality and, you know, the academic part of it and not get into what I call analysis paralysis. Okay, so traditional roles, works with production, provides technical support, applies value analysis, okay? Now, we have some new changing roles of the reliability engineer in terms of um, working with people and motivating and changing the culture. You know, we have soft skills for digital, delivering digital transformation. 
emotional intelligence, personal accountability, meeting management, effective network. These are all things reliability engineer needs to be you know, developing. Our workforce has changed. You know, if you're from with the generations, we're into fourth, fifth generation now. I was a baby boomer, Generation X, Millennials, Gen Z, and now we have whatever we call it with as an aspect of COVID. So, you know, how do we motivate people? You know, we look at values, characteristics of people, their work preferences. You know, I'm a baby boomer. I was in the personal growth, teamwork, you know, individual, competitive, materialistic, you know, that kind of thing. When you look at Gen X, it's changed. Self-reliance, aut autonomy, you know, comfortable with change. And then Generation Y, you know, we have different aspects and there are different people in the workplace that are different generations. So we need to be cognizant of that, that's change, okay? Now, another aspect that's new for us, we have new elements in the reliability engineer's role driven by new technology. Some of you are familiar with the internet of things, okay? Everything is internet, the internet of things. We've got all kinds of technology going on, predictive technology, real-time condition monitor, big data analysis, building failure modes and machine learning, artificial intelligence, wow. And augmented reality, prescriptive maintenance, drones. You know, we got vehicles that are on that. So our technology is changing in a, in a drastic way, especially with what's going on these day and age with COVID. So uh, I want to emphasize that the reliability engineer needs to, you know, get into this stuff and start developing. It is the future. Now, I'm hoping you can see this video. It sounds not that important, but it says it's all about the deployment, okay? Now, this is the Six Sigma cat. He knows all of the tools. He can do all the calculations, but let's see what happens here. <laughs> so again it's all in the deployment we can get caught up in a lot of data analysis and all that kind of stuff but it's it's reality it's deployment okay now i'm going to end here success okay there's one question what about reliability engineering taking a back seat well this is i'm not really into that i think reliability engineers should take a front seat and be involved um, and using your influence uh, i know many companies where reliability engineers are just kind of guys that they feed data you know stay in the closet here's the data and make it look good you know things like that <laughs> you know coming from an aerospace background this is unbelievable i cannot believe it i know one company that um they had all their designs down and very few changes and they said we don't need reliability engineers and they laid off their team of reliability engineers Woo. okay um i don't think in my opinion um the reliability engineer should be part of the integrated product development team. They should not go under any kind of, they should report directly to management as possible, okay? Okay, why industry not achieve reliability like aircraft? Well, they're trying, but there's a lot of old mentality there. Like I was talking about the baby boomers generation and, there's a lot of companies where the reliability engineers, just as I described, and not really involved globally in the company. So you have to really be part of, you know, many companies like Honeywell is a great example, integrated product development team. And the reliability engineer gets involved very early on, even as in during concept. So um, 
one is how do we uh, become a reliability engineer? Well, I've of course recommend, I've been teaching the CRE. If you're familiar with ASQ, you should probably get involved in, you know, the certified reliability engineer. I, I always promote that because it has everything I've been talking about in a broad sense. Um, and get involved in CMRP and all of these other things, but broaden your horizon, get involved. 